name here. I'm Doug Bunn, the Executive Dean here at the Curry Campus of Southwestern. Uh, we're grateful to have all of you here. And if you would, take just a moment to pull out that electronic device that you have and uh, put it on vibrate or silence or something else. Um, let me then turn the time over to Sue Gold. She's going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and we'll start from there. Before we start on the Pledge of Allegiance, I would just like to thank Southwestern uh, Oregon Community Bravo. College. Bravo! And I would also like to thank Senator Wyden for coming and his willingness to listen to our concerns and answer our questions. So with that, we'll say the pledge. If you all stand up, take your hats off and all that good stuff. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I'll now turn this over to Commissioner Boyce. He's going to give you the ground rules and all that good stuff. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioner Gold. A uh, quick side note, Veterans Tributes tomorrow, if you could possibly join us. South County, Brookings Harbor Port, Boardwalk at 11 o'clock, then Gold Beach, the Curry County Veterans Memorial at noon. So again, please join us. Uh, I've been asked to get things going, if, if we could go with the ground rules in a process. If you'd like to ask the Senator a question today, you need a ticket. Okay, if you don't have one yet and want the opportunity to stand and ask a question, raise your hand and staff will come by and get you a ticket. Anybody's hands up here? So everybody's ready? Right here, okay. Thank you. Now, we're gonna ask you to keep your questions brief. No seven minute questions or comments. The Senator would really like to hear from as many people as he possibly can. We've also, uh, you might uh, caught that we provided cards at the entrance so you can uh, submit questions or offer comments. So I'm gonna get to pick the numbers. I'll read uh, the three digits of each ticket. Again, just your last three numbers you wanna look for there. Now if your ticket is called, we need you to stand, come to the aisle, one of the staff will get you a microphone, okay? Again, keep your questions a bit brief and uh, we'll get to as many folks as we possibly can. On behalf of myself and Commissioner Gold, I'm pleased to welcome you, Senator Ron White to Curry County. Today is your 940th town hall. That definitely deserves applause. So this is, he's been doing this throughout the state as part of the commitment that you made to Oregonians when you were first elected to the Senate in 1996. Thank you, sir. And that's namely to hold an annual town hall in every one of Oregon's 36 counties. So now, not to put you on the spot, Senator Wyden, but Curry County hereby requests the honor of your presence at the 2021 Langless Celebration, 140-year celebration, and that would be your 1,000th I massacred that. <laughs> Let's just say 100 Town Hall, and uh, we would sure be honored to have you there for that. And we might settle for 999. But... <laughs> hey, we got, we, got some, uh, we got some support there. Okay. And for that matter, maybe you can uh, come to the 2031 150th language celebration. <laughs> that went over good, too. And Staff Molly McCarthy, you can confirm that Curry County was the first to ask, is that correct? Thank you. Many, many witnesses. Many witnesses. <laughs> so what I'm going to offer next is especially important uh, to the area's wife. I feel great optimism for our county. I'd like to thank Senator Wyden for the work that you've done for all of Oregon. Uh, certainly the fire borrowing fix, funding of our small ports, Yes. Uh, yes, go ahead and applaud. These are working out for long time. And I think this is very significant. Next Friday, he and his staff will be working very hard in Idaho uh, for the Wyden Forest Management 
Forest Management uh, Rural Stabilities Act, and that has a long uh, title, but it should have. It's one of it's potentially one of the biggest pieces of legislation for small Oregon counties. Maybe come out perhaps 20 years, sir. So if you want to write, oh, if you want to write the senator and ask for his contacts of the other senators that he's pushing hard to persuade, call his staff or see me afterwards. So I think very significant here when Senator White is working hard for us in Washington, D.C. He serves on some key committees, finance, budget, intelligence, and also incredibly important to us here. Your efforts as a ranking member of Energy and Natural Resources. You have understood for years the incredible diversity of Oregon, our Oregon outdoors and approved it time and time again. Your quest to not only enhance, but protect. Can we please give a big welcome to Senator Ron White. Thank you. What an inflationary introduction. Thank you, Chris. And how many of you have never been to one of our meetings before? Raise your hands. We've got a fair number of newcomers. Um, if you haven't been, what happens is I, uh, I usually start with a few more remarks, like maybe half hour or 40 minutes or so. And um, it's really a lot of fun. <laughs> and he thinks I'm kind of serious. He's <laughs> going, oh my God, how did I get into this? <laughs> no, this is not what happens at one of these for those who've been, they know. This is part, as Chris said, this is part of the pledge that I made to Oregonians. We were choosing our first new United States Senator, and nobody had ever said, we're just going to throw open the doors of government. We're going to throw them open, and everybody in every county every year is going to be able to talk about what's on their mind. Now, it is no secret that I'm from Portland. I love my hometown. I went to school on a basketball scholarship. Wish I could have played for the Trailblazers. Wasn't going to happen because I was too small. And I made up for it by being really slow. <laughs> but I said then, and I repeat it today, in Curry County, I'm not a United States Senator from the state of Portland. I'm a United States Senator to represent every nook and cranny in Oregon. No matter the size, no matter where it's located. So that's what we're going to do. So the next 90 minutes, you're the faces of democracy. We've got two commissioners here. We do have one little bit of business that we've got to uh, do, Sue and, uh, and Commissioner Boyce. Um, we are so lucky today, and I'm really partial to them. We had gotten some comments about what a wonderful job the college does. But also, my mom was a librarian, and the Oregon Librarian of the Year is with us, Jeremy Skinner of Gold Beach. Give him a big round of applause. Doing wonderful work at the Gold Beach Library, constantly trying to find ways to improve. They've recently added a large community room with a tech lab, not only for adults, but I understand it's for after school kids as well. And maybe we can lure them up here to say a quick word about the library, and then we're going to go right to the meeting. But let's give Jeremy a big round of applause. Our Librarian of the Year. Okay, I don't really have prepared remarks. Um, well, um, the, the honor was given to me by the Oregon Library Association. And what's interesting about that is that, um, like a lot of other rural institutions in Oregon, we don't always get noticed. Um, but we're, we're doing some things that other li libraries in the state are paying attention to. Um, and for those of you that don't use your libraries, I really encourage you to, um, not just the library in Gold Beach, but the other libraries in the county, we're really striving to figure out what community needs are that we can meet. Um, I, I, I think that it's interesting that 
Well, most people think of libraries as places to hold books and exchange books. Um, libraries in the United States were not founded for that purpose. They were founded for people to communicate ideas and to learn and to improve, improve the, the system. And that's what we're trying to do. So um, participate in that. Um, engage with your library. Thank you. Well fed, librarian of the year. Okay, Courtney and Sue are going to kind of run the show here. You guys going to pull names out or some such thing? But folks, no subjects off limits. I heard uh, that maybe there are a couple of issues going on back in DC that people are following. <laughs> but between we know Court, you're following. Between Court and Sue, let's cover anything you're interested in. For the next 90 minutes, we're going to do it the way the Founding Fathers wanted us to do it, okay? Last not going to use hours. any teleprompters, not going to give any speeches. Just talk about what you're interested in, ask a question, whatever you want. We're ready. Thank you, Senator. First number is 402, then 399. 314. I'm looking for Carl King's number, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Carl. <laughs> Hello, Senator Wyden. Um, welcome to Brookings. Thank you for bringing the sunshine. We're so happy to have you here on America's Wild Rivers Coast. And as you probably know, our region has one of the highest concentrations of wild and scenic rivers in America. And we are so grateful for all your efforts to protect their beautiful, clear water, their salmon runs, our drinking water, and all the great recreational opportunities they give us. In particular, I want to thank you for passing the Oregon Wildlands Act earlier this year. benefits all across America, including with the Land and Water Conservation Fund reauthorizing that, but also locally adding protections for tributaries of the Wild and Scenic Elk River, and right here in Brookings, the protecting our Chetco from mining permanently. <laughs> and I also want to thank you for reintroducing um, a bill recently that would permanently protect the headwaters of our Wild and Scenic Illinois, North Fork Smith, and our beloved Hunter Creek and Pistol River from the threat of strip mining. Um, so, with your leadership, we secured, or you helped us secure a 20-year um, ban on new claims in these areas, but we know we have a foreign mining company that still wants to push ahead with existing claims. We know, too, in Washington that multinational mining companies are pushing to streamline regulations um, that are already woefully inadequate to protect communities and clean water, and so we remain concerned about our watersheds. So can you please tell us about um, prospects for your new Oregon Recreation Enhancement Act that would help with those protections? And also, maybe if you have time, about new efforts to reform the Mining Law Act. And I want to also just give you this thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you to thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, here's what this is all about. And I think it's important, particularly before this all gets lost, back in D.C. and that D.C. scene, people talking about bills and amendments and all the rest, is recreation now is a big time economic engine for Oregon and America. And people really appreciate the values behind these special places. Remember, Memorial Day is like you know, 24 hours away, we're going to honor our soldiers. At one of the most recent government shutdowns, what was the thing the veterans cared the most about? They were concerned that the parks and the special places wouldn't be available to them. So y'all are doing a lot of things right. And what I've been trying to do is move the machinery of government around so as to let you do your thing. And particularly that economic multiplier. And when you're talking about recreation jobs, people sell them or sell them equipment. There are guides, there are hotels, there are gas stations, there are people buying food and wine and craft beer, and the list goes on and on. So I'm very pleased about the bill. We did get past 140 miles of, uh, of the Rogue River tributaries, the Chetco Mining Ban that was referred to. We got now 250 miles of protection on, of Wild and Scenic River on my watch which gives us the most in the lower 48. And I told Lisa Murkowski, because Alaska is number one, 
I said, Lisa, we're coming after you. We're going to be number one in terms of wild and scenic river um, protection. And I did reintroduce uh, the part of the bill that we didn't get passed, which has the um, Calmeopsis um, provisions and uh, protection against uh, some of the uh, damage that you were talking about from uh, mining. Look, we know we've got some challenges. You probably caught a little bit of C-SPAN and the like when I had some pretty uh, spirited things to say about David Bernhardt, the head of the Department of you know, Interior. I mean, this guy is a walking conflict of interest. I mean, he has like 27 clients, essentially, that he has potential conflicts of interest in. And finally, at one point, I said, I don't know how this guy is going to spend his day. I mean, either he's going to have to recuse himself from everything and just sit around and read paperback books, or he's going to just have a conflict on everything. So I don't want to underestimate the challenge of trying to take on mining reform. But what I'll tell you, and we'll probably talk some about this in the context of other subjects, Political change, folks, doesn't start in Washington, D.C., and then trickle down. It's bottom up, not trickle down. And if all the people who care deeply about protecting our special places and wild and scenic rivers and understand that the recreation economy is not some abstract thing. I mean, in our state, it pumps billions of dollars into the economy. It's a major economic multiplier. If we do our work, and continue to buttonhole legislators and the like, we're going to get the next piece of legislation stopped, and we're going to get mining reform. And I want as we start this meeting, because of all the great work that you all you know, did, and I remember Copper Salmon and some of our other past victories, I want you to know, as long as I have the honor to represent you in the United States Senate, what an extraordinary honor for a first-generation Jewish kid making sure we understand and people back there understand the opportunities to make recreation an even more powerful economic engine will be right up at the top of my agenda. Repeat the numbers. Certainly, 402, 399, and 314. Oh, here we go. Good morning, or actually good uh, afternoon, Senator. My name is Sue Robson. I'm a fairly new person here in this community and um, homeowner. And Sue, do you guys have like a little Sue coalition going here? You got, like, a lot of, I don't know. A lot, a lot of small Sue's? She's looking for the lucky number. Oh, I see. Okay. Go ahead. Sue in the back. So, as a new person here in the community, I'm um, getting involved in this community. I was wondering what is being, and not knowing enough, so I'm going to ask the question, what is being done for those folks who are um, less privileged, those folks in, in Curry County who are homeless, those folks who may be struggling with addictions, and trying to get help through the nonprofits in this area? How is the state helping Curry County and the nonprofits to help these people um, have a world and have a, have a life that's better than they used to have? I'm going to let um, Court and Sue talk about um, some of the state and the local measures. That, did I lose you? Oh, you're back there. Good. But I want to make sure you understand there's an important federal role to play in terms of those particular services. And I'm the ranking Democrat on the Senate Finance Committee. We have jurisdiction over health care. And I have always felt, since the days when I was director of the senior citizens, I was head of the Oregon Great Panthers for about seven years before I was in public life, I've always felt that if you and your loved ones, and particularly people who don't have power and clout, if you don't have your health, Everything else just goes by the board. And so what we've tried to do, and I really want to commend Court and Sue and the local officials because they've really made this a priority and just hammered it home in terms of uh, Curry County. We have really focused on health care. And at the national level, I'm leading the effort, for example, to make sure that the Trump administration 
can't throw in the trash can protection for people who have a pre-existing health condition. Because if you do that, you take, and there's lots of folks in Oregon, in this part of Oregon in particular, in the coast, a lot of people with modest you know, incomes. You end up letting that federal court unravel those protections. We go back to the days in America when health care was for the healthy and the wealthy. That's what it really means. If you're healthy, no pre-existing condition. If you're wealthy, you can pay for it. But that's not thousands of Oregonians. That's not hundreds on the Oregon you know, coast. So I'm spending a lot of time on those um, particular issues. And let me update you since you're um, new. Uh, there's a big effort uh, with Linda Maxson and Coast Community Health Center to get a clinic uh, placed in Port Orford. They're doing some very good work on uh, that. Um, Brookings, uh, the ER and the Curry Health uh, Hospital is a critical uh, access hospital, which is actually, that program is under the jurisdiction of the Finance Committee. So um, we are working um, closely with them. The slide uh, this spring uh, put us in a situation where folks couldn't get to the ER in Gold Beach. Now, uh, Commissioner Boyce deserves a lot of credit and uh, David Brock Smith working on an urgent uh, care facility um, becoming an ER, which was really important given what just happened. So I want to commend um, folks on, uh, on that. And Commissioner Gold has some good ideas that she would like to pursue as well. But I guess what I tell you, there are a lot of pieces to this puzzle. I sit on the Senate Budget Committee so I can advocate for homeless services, particularly um, housing uh, for the homeless. Uh, on the Finance Committee, we're pursuing the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, which is a major tool to get more shelter, and it's popular with both <coughs> residents and with um, developers. There are a whole host of issues relating to housing and health care, and I will just tell you, perhaps I'm reflecting my bias, um, health care has always been my passion because I've always felt if you and your loved ones don't have your health, then pretty much everything else goes by the board. So I'm spending a lot of time on it. And as you know, there are a couple of big issues that are being discussed back there, and, and Medicare for all, and various other kinds of things. So I'm sure in the course of the afternoon, we'll talk a little more about health care. But I'm so glad that you as a new resident coming in and saying right away you want to be a part of an effort to stand up um, for those without a cloud. By the way, apropos of the nonprofits, there is also a very odd coalition back in DC that would like to unravel a big chunk of the charitable write-off. And what it involves is the people on the left don't like the charitable write-off because they think this is a big break for the fat cats to be able to name buildings after themselves. And then people on the right don't much like it because they say, why don't we don't need any government? People who want to do charity, let them do it, but let's not have a write-off. And so I'm kind of part of a bipartisan group with Senator John Thune, Republican of South Dakota, to defend the charitable write-off. Because while most people don't give because of a charitable write-off, it did, does go to the size of the gift, and it goes to how many gifts. And I can't tell you at the end of the year how many folks come up to me and they say, Ron, I want to give to the church, and I want to give to the senior citizens, people that you've been working for, and I want to give to the kids. And if that charitable write-off goes away, I'll be able to make one donation rather than three. And these are not fat cats. These are like regular working folks. So um, that's probably a longer answer than you wanted, but boy, your question really covers a lot that's very important to the community. <laughs> And around, how are you doing? Good morning. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, really appreciate it. New resident here, um, been in Oregon 30 years, but new to this county. I love it here. Perkins is fantastic. Uh, I want to thank you first for being one of the best of the uh, 100 most important influential folks in the country, able to actually do things. So it's a real honor to be here to speak to you today, and thank you for being so wonderful over the years. 
Um, I have two issues, and I, I'll just graze the first one. If you don't, I prefer to answer on the second one. But real briefly, we've. I just want to touch on the Electoral College because some of the presidential candidates uh, have mentioned it uh, not too long ago, but it seems to have faded. Maybe it'll be back. But the Electoral College, to me, has always been a passionate issue because we've had two of the last three presidents elected with a minority of the vote. And in my opinion, they both, and a lot of other people's opinion too, they've both been a big disaster. This one even worse than the other one, which I didn't think was possible. But um, anyway, I just wanted to bring that up and I wanted to keep it out there. I hope you're out there and we'll do as much as you can to uh, try to get rid of the Electoral College because it's really ridiculous. It's insane. It's the only, we're the only country that does this. And it's the only office that I can think of where the person that, with the least amount of votes actually can get into the office and do tremendous damage. And, um, you know, we don't do sports that way. We don't, can you imagine if the team with less points would win the game? Anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, but my main thing I want to ask you about uh, is that we've been dealing with this nightmare for four years. Um, and I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, been in office two and a half years. Um, in my opinion, a, a traitor and somebody who puts his own interests financially and, and otherwise in front of the country's interests. Um, you know, uh, it's just gone on for so long. I feel it's very important that we try to remove and impeach. Um, I know there's a lot of debate among the Democrats on you know what we should do, but I know that Earl Blumenauer and Susan Bonamici have come out for impeachment. I know it's something that starts in the House. And so they have to do that first. But I wanted to hear what your opinion on it is. And if it does get passed, will you, uh, will you vote to convict based on what we know now? Uh, because I feel that from what we've seen over the last four years, even when he was running, we have a loose cannon. We have a chaos president who has uh, been rattling the, you know, the saber rattling lately with Iran. Uh, possibly getting us into a war, who knows, uh, with Korea, a nuclear war. So I'm really scared that if we don't get rid of them, uh, you know, I would, even, I would feel, even though I don't agree with uh, Mike Pence, I feel that at least we would have somebody, uh, you know, with a sane, you know, anything is better than what we got now. And I'm really worried about what could happen, uh, sending troops and whatnot. And I'll let you take it from there because I feel it is our number one top priority in this country right now. All the other stuff doesn't make any difference if... Sure. Okay. What, uh... What we decided about 940 town meetings ago was that these are official state meetings. It's not like the Democratic Party is getting together and the Republican Party is getting together. This is about um, what's good for Oregon, I call it the Oregon way. So let me, if I might, kind of pick up on some of the issues that you're you know, talking about that are um, particular, particularly relevant. I have a friend who said, you know, I get so angry at all of this stuff that's going on in Washington, Ron. By Thursday, I can't even remember what I was angry about on Monday. And um, you've got, just in the last, couple of weeks, you've got the president calling law enforcement officials treasonous. You've got, you know, around the country with the support of the administration, rolling back an effort to roll back 40 years worth of law with respect to reproductive health and having the government rather than women decide what's going to happen to their health care. So I think I could go on. I got up yesterday at 4 o'clock in the morning to do um, the NPR uh, show um, on this very troublesome new uh, decision by the president to give the Attorney General, Mr. Barr, authority to declassify whatever he wanted. And what I will tell you, because I've studied his record, I, I think, I think the Attorney General is the Babe Ruth of surveillance, you know, hypocrisy. On one hand, he says if you've got a FISA warrant with respect to the Russia investigation, that's spying. But then he's gone out and testified for warrantless surveillance and set up a warrantless surveillance operation at the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration. So, I mean, every day, 
we have these kinds of challenges. And I think what happens is at some point, people just sort of become numb and try to you know, figure out how to deal with it all. Because literally, all these things are just things that have come up in the last couple weeks. Um, for me, the debate about your question, and as you noted correctly, impeachment does start in the House of Representatives. And I, if the, pre if the president is impeached in the House, I would, in effect, be a juror in a trial you know, in the Senate. Um, really involves, in my view, kind of setting the table in terms of where we are. During the presidential campaign, the president actually said that he could shoot people with a gun walking down the streets, and his allies would stay with him and support him for doing that. And you kind of take your breath away here and say, you know, isn't this a signal that they think they're above the law? Now, the relevant qu answer to your question is, do you see people in the United States Senate saying that they are going to take him on on that? I may be missing something. I might have left the floor for a couple of minutes. But I don't see any evidence of it. So I think now there needs to be an effort to tackle you know, these kinds of questions. I'm very involved with the ranking Democrat in the Senate Finance Committee on the issue of the president being required to disclose his taxes. That's been done by every Democrat and every Republican, every conservative, every liberal, for four decades since Watergate. It is the lowest ethical bar for a president disclosing their taxes. What's the point of it? We want to find out if your allegiance is to all of you who are here in the audience, or if your allegiance is to somebody else, like possibly, maybe, kind of, sort of, Russia, because they've already talked as a family that much of their portfolio is made up of Russian money. So that's a long way to answer your question. It reflects how I'm spending my time. We'll see what the House does. As you know, there's a difference of opinion in the House between the Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, and some of her members, but we'll see how they resolve. It's especially unstable, so do you, which side are you on? Are you in favor of the Democrats going for, he's obviously mentally ill, or mentally something. I have to say every day it's an outrage. Um, it, you know, are you in favor of the Democrats proceeding to impeach somebody who's obviously, that's why impeachment is in the, for something just like this. If it's not, if you can't do it now, when are we, I mean, this is a, I think, this, I think we're kind of maybe mixing up a couple of things. I think you may be talking about the amendment that allows for removal of a president who's mentally infirm, and then there's impeachment and the like. I think I've given you my views on impeachment. I will tell you what I'm doing, how I'm spending my time. I'm spending my time pushing back whether it's David Bernhardt at the Department of Interior, whether it's the taxes, whether it's intelligence and declassification. I'm a sponsor of the legislation to make sure that the president doesn't get us into an unauthorized war in Iran. So that's all I'm saying. Thank you. I've got the drift. Thank you. OK, we've got three more lucky people. Two, or excuse me, 328, then 412, then 329. Those folks here? 328? Right over here. Not 412. Oh, okay. It's 328 here. That's a horrible thing to say, isn't it? Someone's a number. How about 412? Okay, we'll go with 412. Hi, Cindy. Um, I am a newly retired teacher of biology, uh, environmental literacy, and I moved here about four years ago. And I, I currently work with the Chico uh, Watershed Alliance as an environmental nonprofit, and they've been around for quite a while. They just work on the Del Mo. 
Um, two of my guys, there are nine people I sit with, three biologists, two veterans, two fishermen, two environmental attorneys, me, I'm an environmental literacy teacher, biology teacher, um, like I said. Uh, two of my guys can't be here, and I'm speaking on behalf of them. They're Vietnam vets, and during Vietnam, they were both, the reason they can't be here is because they're very, very sick, and both men aren't gonna live much longer. So, I'm sorry I'm a little emotional about it, but during Vietnam, they uh, were sprayed with a proprietary cocktail of different aerial defoliants, which come under, under different names, but this is a cocktail, and they both currently go back and forth from Portland, San Diego, they're in special studies to for Agent Orange and other chemicals. Um, my point is, speaking here today, is, is that um, I'm also friends with a retired water master for the state, and that's through my um, watershed group I work on. And we got to sit down and talk about um, what type of chemicals are used right behind me where I live, just a few miles down the road, um, on various clear cuts. And again, there are proprietary chemicals, the water master never in the state don't, aren't privy to what's in these cocktails, but they do know how much water will be used at any given time. So, um, my point is, is that there's spraying that occurs right behind me, and I asked him, would you drink this water? He said, absolutely not. And um, he has young children, he just said no. Um, he said- can, can you, I mean, you're making extraordinarily important points. Can you get me his name? Because if so your water master yeah. is saying that he would have his family drink the water, that is show stopping information. I just want to break down there. Yeah, I, I want to have his name uh, so that we can follow it up because oh, okay. cer certainly uh, I think we may be talking about some lands that are either state and local, but as you know, federal land is always interspersed um, on the Oregon coast with state and local lands in a lot of instances. So I want the name of the water master we'll be in contact with. Okay, but my question is, um, you might be aware of this, it's going through the state legislature, but there's the Oregon State Waters Act that'll end clear cutting and chemical sprays in our drinking water supplies. This is on the Pacific Rivers website. Um, I just wanted, it, I think it was March 19th they had the first hearing, and I don't know that the number of that particular piece of legislation, but um, it has to do with clear cutting, logging roads, application of chemical herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers on forest lands that degrade clean drinking water sources and sediments, thermal pollution and other contaminants, and elevate the risk of wildfires, flooding, landslides, and toxic algae blooms. So that's something I'm gonna be working on with my group, with my guys, but um, just- Can I ask you a question yeah. about that? Since that bill that is moving in Salem deals with this topic, yeah. do any of the materials that have come out in connection to the bill list what kind of herbicides or what kind of spraying is done? Because that will kind of jumpstart our inquiry if I have that information. I can look all that up. Well, yeah, that'd yeah. be great. And then so the last part I just wanted to touch on is, is that this fall, I don't know what else happened. Okay, so I own my own home. I'm moving. Um, partly because of this spring and my water's treated with chlorine. And it comes out of, because they're on a hardship permit with their well, Whales Head draws uh, their drinking water from Whales Head Creek. Very tiny creek, overextended. It is sprayed, it, it, it does, that whole watershed, Cape Borello, Martin Ranch, that area my, where I live, that area is sprayed and the water master and I were talking about it in detail about it. Um, you know, I want to support my community. I don't want to have to move out of my community because I'm, you know, afraid of getting contamination or pesticides in my water or herbicides. So um, we just had a post-fire burn that got into the paper, but not much coverage in the pilot, a little bit. My friends, firefighter friends, fought on that fire along with firefighters all along the coast. It was an absolute post-fire logging at the top of Whale's Head, you could watch the whole thing. 
I had friends in wheelchairs asking me how they could get out of there. We were evacuating. A lot of us evacuated, but it was a fire that was left to burn. It was post. It was a, a slash and burn. It's a clear cut. I'm a forestry major. Anyway, so it, it so you can see the whole thing. It's a major burn scar, but it was going towards Wells Head. And we were going to get wiped out according to the <coughs> firefighters, and it switched directions towards Brookings. And luckily, there were enough firefighters that were volunteers, thanks to all those guys, and men and women. Um, they extinguished it before, and that was someone who left left the scene when they should have been watching the the fires that they were they started. That was a, started by people, you know, cleaning up the clear cut. So I'm concerned about that kind of forestry, and I, you know, going to other sort of uh, other forestry practices. Uh, that are more sustainable actually uh, increases jobs. I mean, I sit down and do this research all the time with my group. It increases jobs. Mechanization is what got rid of jobs for loggers. And uh, so I just wanted to say I hope that you can support that piece of legislation if you have anything to do with it, because I'm certainly going to be working well, on it. it. I want to talk about fire and outline particularly what happened this week, because I think this week is an opportunity for us really to move ahead as a state and, uh, and country. Um, apropos, first of all, with respect to your concern about spraying, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the water master information. I'll work with Court and Sue. We'll get the state health reports because, as you know, they're regular state health reports. So we ought to be in a position to get that information out, and Molly McCarthy is here, and she'll do it. So let's put the spraying issue over here, and now let's start talking about some of the matters with respect to fire. And as Court made mention of the fact, uh, I wrote the bill with Senator Mike Crapo, which is now going into effect, which will finally end the discrimination against fire prevention which is something we've had with fire borrowing. What's happened is, over the years, the government has shorted fire prevention, then a big fire breaks out, the government raids the prevention fund to put the fire out, and the problem gets worse. And now, under the bill that Senator Crapo and I wrote, with more than 250 groups, environmental groups and scientists, and industry people and the like, the big fires are not going to be fought by raiding the prevention money any longer. The big fires will be fought with funds from the disaster accounts because they're disasters. Okay? Now, the second area that I'm concerned about is second growth because I hear constantly from people in watershed councils and the like about unhealthy second growth where you've got you know tree limbs and small diameter trees and all the rest so uh, this week I introduced a bipartisan bill that in my view is going to give Oregon, if we can get all the watershed councils and all the community groups together, it would give us a chance to be first in terms of dealing with unhealthy second growth. And I think it'd make a real difference in the battle against fire. You're going to hear a fair amount of talk about this going forward as well. It is a different issue than the spraying issue that you're talking about, ma'am. And we will be all over the spraying issue on Tuesday morning with Ms. McCarthy. And we'll have emails and um, phone numbers, email addresses and phone numbers. Because as far as I'm, I'm concerned, you don't play Russian roulette with the safety of people's drinking water. And that's one of the reasons why I put in all the time with the uh, tributaries and protecting them to try to make sure that drinking water is safe. So what you have said is potentially showstopper business, and we'll be on it um, first thing Tuesday morning. Thank you. OK, next is 329.
Um, yeah, I'm concerned about what's happening on our southern border with Mexico and the immigrants coming over and especially the families. I mean, I really know firsthand how difficult it is to be separated from a child and um, even an older child, but these mothers who are being separated from their babies is just really criminal in my, my view. And what can we do about that to make, to really respect immigrants who are fleeing very difficult situations and how can we welcome them into our communities rather than rejecting them and making life just harder for them, um, especially, especially the family separation. I'm really concerned about that. The idea that you pull children from their parents, that is contrary to everything our country has always been about. Yes. And certainly, certainly devastating to a child's long-term interest on the Finance Committee, we have jurisdiction over several of the programs that involve you know, young people. We had the Secretary of Health and Human Services come and say, we know exactly where the parents are of these kids and where to go to link the things. We have portals and we have computers. And I'll tell you folks, that's just a bunch of baloney. That is baloney. They have not been able to show that they can keep track of where all the kids are and what it's going to take to bring the families um, together. So we are pushing back on that, along with several of the other matters that um, I just talked about. I also think what the administration is doing is basically rewriting the principles of asylum. What these families, the vast majority of them are doing is seeking asylum from people who wish to kill them, or rape them, or politically um, abuse them, and the like, gangs, and, and the like. And somehow, asylum law is being rewritten so as to not allow them even the opportunity to safe refuge. One of the reasons that they're coming is because we ended policies that would allow people in those countries to feel that the United States was supporting policies that would give them a chance to get ahead. So you cut the funds for uh, funds to those uh, several countries, and then, of course, you're going to see more people seek asylum here. So this is a broken policy, and I'll just, so nobody's confused about it, I want everybody in this community, in Curry County, to know I think America is a better and stronger country because of immigration. Okay? My parents, my parents are first immigration. My father fled the Nazis. Um, not all our family got out. Our great uncle Max was one of the last guests in Auschwitz. And all my dad wanted to do was talk his way into our army so he could drop uh, pamphlets on blankety blank Hitler. That's how he described him. There was always several words before his name. And, um, those are pretty amazing pamphlets. I just found out that there are pictures of my dad's propaganda <coughs> against Hitler in the Holocaust Museum. So I'm looking forward to getting over there and, and seeing them. I didn't know that they were uh, there. So um, that's probably a longer answer than you wanted as well, but you're talking about an important issue. Thank you. Uh, Excuse me, 307, 330, and 427. Oh, I agree. <laughs> oh, you got a mic right there. Right there. <laughs> Boy, I, I get the hot mic. Okay. Um, first of all, I heard you on your PR. You were um, out the when gun, you, gun the arm? No, that was East Coast down, oh. I think. <laughs> I heard it yesterday morning as I was running around trying to get ready for a wonderful Azalea Festival parade. But I am extremely concerned about Curry County. I've lived here three years. I have a background in accounting and finance, so I understand economic indicators and, and what they mean. Our housing situation here is critical. Uh, we had a housing study done, I don't know if you're familiar with it, that was done for Curry County. And we, we're just, it's too wonderful here. And people want to move here. And I'm all about supply and demand. 
Um, I can be a very fiscal conservative person because of my training and background and what I've seen in corporate America. But people are moving here and they have California housing dollars to do it. And normal people cannot afford to live in Curry County. And we have nowhere to build. There are no suburbs. We're, we're locked in by the mountains and the ocean. And if you aren't aware of the situation without going on and on, there's a lot to it. I, I want to at least get that housing study to you and see if you have anything to offer because our county doesn't have any money. I mean, basically what the housing study said is housing is infrastructure at this point because no one who has a wage from Curry County can afford to really live in Curry County. And I actually ran for mayor in November and I went door to door the old fashioned way. That's what everybody said to do and boy, that's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> to do the door to door stuff. I came across a business owner who had four construction trucks in front of his house. He had people that wanted to move here and work for him. And they said, oh, no problem, I'll live in my car because you know it doesn't get real cold or real hot. For a month, I'll find a place to live. They, they're here for three months. And they finally say, I can't live in my car anymore and I'm going back to the valley and I hate that because I want to live here. So we have higher housing costs because we don't have the people to build the houses. We have a lot of people moving here and that's just gonna get worse. We have a lot of people to, I just met somebody yesterday. I'm here from after the Paradise Fire. We moved here, you know. It's a real critical thing for Curry County and probably most of the coast. We have nowhere to build and we're becoming very imbalanced. So if you are aware of that and you have anything to add, but I want to get you information from the housing Good. study. And, and I think it's worth noting that I think it was three of the first four speakers, starting I think with you ma'am and the gentleman in the back, all said they were new. So yeah. this is not some abstract, and I see everybody pointing to each other, all you know, newcomers, and we're glad you're here, but we've got to figure this out. Now, I regard housing as one of those kind of essentials, and I kind of look at this as, as for, sort of an essentials toolbox. I mentioned in connection with you the community health centers and some of the things that are a real lifeline in terms of making sure people have health care. There are similar lifelines available. Um, in the housing area, they're just not quite long enough. Um, for example, the low income housing tax credit, which I mentioned in connection with folks who are homeless, is something that goes through the Finance Committee, where I'm the ranking Democrat. We probably need to increase it tenfold if you look at what the challenge is across America. And that's one of the things I'm looking at, is trying to have a very substantial expansion of that. For, because dollar for dollar is one of the best programs to get people on their feet and be in a position to be upwardly mobile. In other words, they're those workers that you talked about and otherwise are sleeping in their car and they'd like to be here and they'd like to make that their first job and then they'll get a better second job and then eventually they'll have their own business and they'll build their own you know, house. So we need a sort of essentials toolbox and healthcare and housing to me are the most important you know, items and you need a roof over your head and you need decent healthcare. Those two things are the prerequisite. And that's what I'm focused on. And they're very tied. Very much so. Because, uh, if you don't have housing, you get sick. Well, what, a, not, what a surprise. If you don't have housing, the healthcare workers won't move you. <coughs> we also come across that. Yeah. A physical therapist, a traveling physical therapist, you know what they make. Yeah. They were rooming someone <clears throat> in Brookings to be able to live here and work. They could not find, there is no, I mean, rentals are, it's really critical. So any any help you can give us. Well, I, I'm just telling you exactly what I'm working on. We're yeah. expanding the low income housing tax credit because that dollar for dollar will be the best tool for the people you just talked about. Any 
idea how soon that might? Well, as you know, we're, we're busy giving hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks to the people at the top, rather than having <laughs> something like this. And now we're talking about having unauthorized wars with Iran and Venezuela and who knows who else when John Bolton shows up for lunch and decides he wants to have a few more wars. So um, there are some challenges about the priorities. Yeah. Rumor heard it that there was an election coming up. <laughs> we getting close. No, no, we're fine. We're fine. Next numbers. Just next numbers. I have four to seven. Oh, great. Hi, I'm uh, also a fairly recent person up here. <laughs> I, <laughs> I came from Oakland High where Damien Lillard was an honor student of mine and uh, I'd like to share his contribution to Oregon along with a lot of other peoples. Uh, one observation related to things about workers not sleeping in their trucks and that is how the census will deal with those kind of issues. The uh, administration obviously is trying to keep census figures inaccurate. The putting on the citizenship question <coughs> is certainly related to that. But uh, I, I, I recently was in Oakland in the Bay Area and the amount of people living in RVs is just getting extraordinary. The Washington Post had a big story about it. I've been following the story. Yeah, and uh, anyway, so much services are related to census figures. And I bet you those people are not going to be reached very effectively or accurately, either in the Bay Area or here, where there are very similar problems. I, I believe the House of Representatives will pass legislation requiring that the census do what a census is supposed to be all about, which is to count people in an accurate way rather than in a politically selective kind of uh, fashion. I don't know what the Senate's going to do. We're going to do our best to try to get this across. There are a lot of senators who represent hard-hit rural areas, and those rural areas are going to depend on the census for some services that they also care about. So um, I'm going to be asking some of those senators to vote their self-interest, which would be to count the people on the basis of where they are and who they actually are, rather than on the basis of political um, selection and, and fudging the numbers for political gain. Do we have a third one? Please, what was your number? This is 407. Oh, it's right over here. Thank you. Here's our third one. My name is Chuck Weller. I'm from Brookings. I've been here for 27 years. <laughs> uh, retired educator, administrator, and uh, small business owner as a counselor for 20 years. I, um, as a counselor, I'm very concerned about the mental health of the country um, and the president. Um, we keep waiting for him to change. I would like to point out that he can't change. Literally cannot change. Uh, he won't change. And he'll remain the same and get worse as he has been getting worse. I do believe that he's taking orders from someone else. And the things that he's doing are uh, a pattern that we've seen, um, he's, he's really is taking orders from someone else. Um, you said earlier that the voice, there, is, well, there are no voices in the Senate for impeachment. Uh, I would like to remind you uh, with due respect that you are in the Senate. And, um, re respectfully, sir, I didn't use those words. Those are your words, not no, mine. You said what that. I said, and I'll, I'll, I'll okay. try it once more, is after the president said that he could shoot people and his supporters wouldn't object, 
I said I didn't see any evidence of pushback from the Senate on that or a variety of other issues. So I didn't talk about any specific vote on impeachment or anything like it. I tried to make sure that people understood how serious this is. When the president makes a statement, and you uh, evidently are someone knowledgeable about mental health, that is that disturbing, you would think that people in his own political party would yes. have questions about it. Yes. And that was not the case. And so as decisions are made about these issues, I always tell people, particularly people I like, shoot the messenger if you don't like the message. I think it's important when I'm home to be factual with people about what is an issue. Now, I very much share your view with respect to the mental health challenge, and I'm spending a lot of my time right now working on mental health questions. And uh, for those of you that know a little bit uh, about our household, mental health is not an abstract issue in the Wyden household. My brother was a schizophrenic. He died way too young. My father wrote a book called Conquering Schizophrenia. Not a night went by for years on end when I wasn't worried that he was going to hurt himself or somebody else on the streets. And uh, we're probably a golf game away, a golf game away between Lindsey Graham and the President of the United States from seeing another effort to roll back mental health coverage. It'll come in the form of something called the Graham-Cassidy Bill, which I led the opposition to, to eliminate the safety net that is Medicaid, because Medicaid covers much of the mental health services in America. And there was an effort by Senators Graham and Cassidy to pass this legislation in the last Congress, and I was able to block it in the Finance Committee. But every time I turn on the TV on Saturday and I look to see if Lindsey Graham and the President are playing golf, I'm saying to myself, I just hope all those people, in the name of my late brother, Jeff Wyden, aren't going to lose their mental health coverage as a result of the golf game. And I want folks here to know it isn't going to happen. As long as I'm the ranking Democrat on the Senate Finance Committee, anybody who wants to unravel the mental health services that are available today, which are far from sufficient, is going to have to run over me, and we're going to win. Okay, we've got three more lucky numbers. 426, are they here? 312? 327. 312. 312. Okay. <coughs> Jerry Lynn Thompson, uh, as a member of the Colorado Nation, I'd really like to thank you, and I'm more grateful for all that you've done for us. Mel Hell. Yes, we do need it here in Kern County. <coughs> As a resident of Upper Chetco, I'm uh, going to bring you back to fire a little bit. <laughs> We're coming up on 2000, or 2019 fire season, probably a few weeks away. <coughs> the Calmeopsis is burnt, the middle, the north, all that's left now is the south end. Can we ask you to help us in any way you can? If there's another wildfire, to put it out. I don't want to hear of any more late night messages. Jerilyn, what can you do about the proposed 100,000 acre back burn? Let's put the fires out and be done with them. So I'm asking for your help for all of us in Kern County this stuff. Help us put them out. Well, well what, what I've been for, ma'am, is throwing everything we've got at these fires. That's why I wrote the fire borrowing legislation. That's why I wrote the plan to go in there and deal with the backlog. That's why I just proposed going after second growth. That's why I've led the fight for air tankers. 
So I'm all in on this. And the only thing I would want to convey is I don't think you want your United States senators to basically be the on-the-ground managers of fire. You want your fire <laughs> professionals to do it. It's my job to make sure they have the tools. And I can tell you they're going to have them, period. <laughs> Also, yes. local, pe local people that know the area. Yes, that's a very reasonable request, and too often that has not been the case. That's not so the case. what we ought to do, because um, I've already had some fire briefings already, and I'm very concerned that this is going to be another <coughs> very punishing fire season. What I'd like to do, Molly, and I'd like to do it next week so that it is done promptly, is get the local folks and the agencies together so that we're clear that if and when there is another big fire like it happens in 10 days, we've got everybody coordinated in terms of how we're going to make sure all the voices are heard and we move quickly. Okay? I don't want to see a repeat of some of the back and forth that happened before. All right? Is that acceptable? Thank you. All right. And what we'll do is Molly will make sure that meeting is set up immediately. We'll get on it on Tuesday. Okay? Thank you. As a reminder, 327. Right up here. Uh, thank you for all the good work you're doing. It's really great having you representing us. Um, I, I know this is kind of difficult at this time to try to pass any legislation in the Senate or the Congress in general, but I'd like to perhaps, uh, it seems that people now are getting a better idea of the power of corporations, especially multinational, powerful money corporations that are influencing a lot of our uh, laws, a lot of our lives. In, in ways that we don't even notice most of the time anymore. But people are becoming wiser to what's going on. And I know it may be a little difficult to pass any legislation, but I, I'd like to put forth the possibility of considering, rather than fighting all these little battles on all these little fronts, is perhaps consider legislation that deals with something akin to do no harm kind of legislation towards corporate law in general rather than fighting every little so-called fire that pops up when a corporation wants something from us. And how exactly would what you're talking about with do not harm work, how, how would that um, fall? Well, it, it, would, it would mean in terms of saying, if, if you're putting together uh, a, uh, a proposal, a product, that this ensures that it's not going to harm the waters, it's not going to... Kind of do not harm impact statement. Exactly, yeah. in some way. Even when we're talking about the tech companies with Facebook, they, they, should, be, uh, <laughs> they, they should be thoughtful about not doing any harm rather than simply abiding by specific laws that deal with specific items where it becomes more of a general kind of citizenry of doing no harm. We, we have this in, in terms of, you know, doctors. Just do no harm to begin with. Before you set out putting together a new product or new proposal or, or some way of, of changing the world. You know, the, the idea you're, you're talking about is uh, certainly interesting in the sense that it builds on what we already have, for example, with the environment. We have environmental impact statements. So that if you're going to have a big project, you have to um, look at all the ramifications in terms of the environment. So you might just see if you can build on it. Mr. McGeary is here from our Washington office. Malcolm, get the gentleman's um, email and phone, and let's see if anybody has thought about the kind of do not harm statement. You know, it's a it's a different way of kind of getting at it and sort of builds on what's supposed to be done for the environment. I think it's definitely um, an idea worth looking at. Okay? Now, I do want to make sure that everybody knows um, 
about where things are on a couple of major um, issues that haven't been discussed. And the gentleman was kind of hanging crepe and nothing's going to pass and all the rest. Um, the big focus of mind when Congress comes back next week will be working in the Senate Finance Committee with Republicans, with Democrats, to pass legislation to end pharmaceutical price gouging. Okay? And I will tell you that because there has been such a rage of anger, literally from sea to shining sea, I think we're in a position to really have a shot at this. Charles Grassley is the chairman. He and my staff have been working together for weeks to see if we can come up with a package that's meaningful. It's got to be meaningful, folks. It can't just be something that says, oh, pharmaceutical ripoffs are going away. It's got to, for example, deal with this outrageous restriction in Medicare. You know, where Medicare is barred from bargaining to hold down the cost of medicine. And there are more than 50 million seniors. So there's got to be something that gives seniors and the Medicare program, the country's biggest program, real bargaining power. You've got to deal with insulin, which is hugely important for people who've had diabetes. And the price of the insulin has gone up 13-fold in the last few years. Insulin is not 13 times better today, or 13 times more effective. These companies charge these prices because they can get away with it under the law. And that's what I'm going to be next week focused on trying to do. In terms of the do no harm legislation, that does harm to people's uh, finances. Well, yeah, I think the way I think you're talking about it is, are you going to make it worse? I want to end up stopping the ripoffs on insulin, stopping the ripoffs on list prices, stopping the middlemen, the pharmaceutical <coughs> benefit managers from ripping you off at your pharmacies um, on the coast. That's what I'm talking about. It's going beyond do no harm, but I, I like your concept. I also want, because I see time is short, to make you aware of one other thing that I'm spending a lot of my time on that has not come up. And that is, I'm on the Intelligence Committee. My older child calls it the so-called Intelligence Committee. <laughs> and I want you to know, as of today, I'm very concerned that what happened in the 2016 elections, what happened in the 2016 elections is going to look like small potatoes compared to what's happened in, going to happen in 2020. Yes. And that we're not just talking about the Russians. I'm not getting into classified matters. We're talking about an array of hostile foreign actors who will undermine the integrity of elections. And I am doing everything I can to make sure that in our country, we don't have an election the first Tuesday in November, and it's a very close outcome, and people feel that there's been cheating, and the victor is the result of the cheating. So I'm spending a great deal of time on it. I've introduced a piece of legislation called the PAVE Act, which would require hand-marked paper ballots. Yeah. It would require limiting audits. It would require basic cybersecurity principles like you don't leave networks open to wireless <laughs> connections. And so you'll know the biggest opponent of this is the voting machine lobby. Yes. And why you might ask would that be the case? Because selling um, insecure voting machines you can make a lot of money on and you don't make as much money if you're in the voting machine lobby with paper ballots, handmarked paper ballots. So these people will, in my view, stop at virtually nothing. They're 
unaccountable to anyone. They're really above the law. They lied to me. They lied to the Congress. They lied to the New York Times about the extent uh, several years ago when they had remote access software in their voting machines, which I have compared to putting American ballot boxes on the streets of Moscow. And so I am all in in this fight to try to make sure that in 2020, people walk away, somebody will win, somebody will lose, but people don't say this election was stolen from us and we didn't allow practices that are worse in 2020 than what were allowed in um, 2016. We have big moves on three. Stacey Stacey Abrams, the um, candidate in uh, in Georgia, came out strongly for the bill. As has been virtually all of the Georgia, you know, legislators who are concerned about the integrity of the vote. Uh, someone asked me, "Do we have a Republican?" The answer is no. But I'm telling you that, like many of the issues we're talking about here today, we create enough grassroots pressure, I think we have a chance to get these changes in place. We have basically like 90 days. Um, in my bill called the Payback, um, if it were passed by the fall, you have a year's run up. So you basically have between the fall of 19, uh, 2019 and the fall of 2020 to get it into effect. So I hope that you'll join me. If you have friends around the country, Call them and tell them they ought to be for the payback, Protecting America Votes Act. And who will be right? Who do, what, well, what we'll, we? we'll get you a list of them, but you got friends around the country, and there's a bill in the House, and you can tell your friends. Um, it won't matter if I call Senator so-and-so from 2,000 miles away, but you do, it will. And we all ought to say, and I guess we're pretty much done. I'm going to stick around and visit with people. This wonderful experiment over 200 years of governance, we don't want to wake up the day after election and say, gee, that's the way it goes. It's really not that way anymore. It's not that way anymore because you can basically go out and steal an election. And I'm putting in a lot of time on that. Questions of pharmaceutical practices, apropos of what the gentleman says, and we get done. And we'll do everything I can to protect the integrity of our elections. Oregon, by the way, does so many things right, but Oregon doesn't have the money to do the risk-limiting audits. You know, their idea, you can ask the elections people in Curry County, they can check a few ballots. But after we gave the multinational corporations hundreds of billions of dollars, we sure as heck can run an election where everybody <laughs> can get a hand-marked paper ballot, and we can have in place the audits and uh, uh, the cybersecurity procedures that ensure we don't have wireless connections and, and things like that. Um, let me just give you one last thought, and that is, Town meeting number 940, almost over, a couple minutes. A really good one, because Curry County has, as is usually the case, really stuck you know, to what matters, whether it's health care, whether it's the economy, whether it's housing, whether it's the future of American you know, institutions. And I'm pretty sure I see my friend Jim Little back there, is that him? Back? Jim Rogers. Jim Rogers, excuse me. That's Jim Rogers, yes. Our, 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 our friends, we have, there's another Jim further up the valley that we were working with. Yeah. But let's have a big round of applause for Jim Rogers. <laughs> who, has, who has been Mr. Recreation for years and years and, and put this area with the copper salmon bill that I was proud to be the sponsor of out in front and uh, invisible. So Jim, it's great to have you here. We also, by the way, didn't have a thank you for our wonderful law enforcement people. Let's um, give them a big shout out.
officers, everybody was well behaved, I thought, huh? Yeah, not bad. Nobody's fighting, nobody's, nobody's throwing any punches. But look, what you've done today, there hasn't been a bad question in the house. Not a bad question or comment in the house. This is what the founding fathers ought to look, wanted it to look like. I can tell you I don't have all the answers. But as long as I have the honor to represent you in the United States Senate, this is the way we'll do it. Thanks, everybody. Can I extend gratitude to your staff? Absolutely. They have been, not only to take our phone calls, I don't, I, I'm always surprised when they do, but they're continually seeking solutions and they care about where you're getting. I don't know if they train you or you train them. Oh, big, great. big thank you to your staff. Good. Thank you.